God, thank you for all your blessings. And thank you that Michael's able to go back to work. And I pray that you would uh, just uh, watch over him in that. I pray for those who are suffering and um, pray for Brandon especially, and his family. And pray for joy. Please uh, let the operation be successful and help her recovery to be uh, smooth. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Okay, well, let's look at those three verses that are on your handout from chapter 61. Um, uh, we had uh, part one, which was about the Messiah presented as what? Anyone remember? Uh, as king. Uh -huh. And then uh, part two, which was, um, this was one through 39. Uh, roughly, there's some debate about at what point you should make the transition. Um, this is, yeah, some people would say 37 or 38, but anyway, somewhere around there. Um, uh, 40 through 55, the Messiah is presented as the servant. Yes, we covered that last week. And today and next week, our last two classes, we'll cover part three, where the Messiah is presented as what? Yes. Conqueror, or I think. And it's 11 chapters. Um, and uh, if you remember a few weeks ago talking about chiasms, does anyone remember that? What, does anyone remember what a chiasm is? I'll give you a clue. Chi is the yeah, a Greek letter that's shaped like that. Um, so it just means shaped like an X. And so what does that mean for when you're reading? Uh huh. Right. Yeah. So there's some. Yeah, mirror images is a good way. Like an X is a mirror image. Yeah. So there's something parallel there, and something parallel there, and it can be as big or as small as as the writer wants it to be. And what is connected between that it can be. Um, just a word or an idea or a similar story. It could be anything. And I'm trying to think of a situation outside the Bible where people might use it. Um, well, in mathematics, they use it as a reflection or inversion to try to understand the difference between positive and negatives and graphing. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. So they use it in math. Also, a lot of times, um, speakers will use it. Um, they'll start with a little anecdote that just kind of leads into what they're speaking about. And at the end, they come back to that anecdote to like wrap it together, which is, which is a small one. You just have like bookends, right? Um, a lot of movies will do that too, right? Like you could call that a frame story. And then it moves into the, and then at the end, it, you know, like, the person's an adult, and they're looking back, and then the whole movie's about their childhood, and at the end, they're an adult again. So you see how that's a chiasm, a small chiasm. So, anyway, it's used all the time. Hi. Hi. You I didn't miss I'm anything. Like, that's okay. No. Um... Barb, do you remember what a chiasm is? That's what we're talking about. It's just review. Um, no, I don't think I do. Okay, well, it's just um, 
when there's a story that has something at the beginning and end that are similar, something in the middle that's similar, and then the focal points at the center. That's all. Um, and this whole last section, part three, is a big chiasm. That's why we're talking about it. Um, so what we're going to do is today we're going to focus on the focal point, and then next week we'll talk about how that all fits in and cover the whole picture. So we're just just focusing on the center, which as you can see is uh, in chapter 61. And it's, we're not even able to focus on the entire center. An 11 chapter uh, chiasm, the center can be large, um, which it is in this case. Maybe someone has done more research and found out that of the center there is an even centraler center. But if so, I don't know about that. So, I think this uh, will at least give us a good feel for what the center of this whole section about the conqueror is. Okay, so um, would someone like to read verses 1, 2, and 3? In chapter 61? Just to start us off, I would read it out of the notes oh, okay. because uh, because then we'll all be on the same version and we're going to be working out of that, circling things and whatnot later. So you can. Does your version seem different from that, Dean? It might be the same, believe it or not. Okay. But, uh, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Provide for those who grieve and die on them. And sell on them the crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. It's called hopes of righteousness. Oh, that's good right there. Yeah, okay. Sorry yeah. about leaving that little thing in there. Um, I meant to delete that on your copy. Um, <laughs> probably confused you for a second. Um, but anyway, okay, good. Um, so let's first start out by comparing lines two and three. Does anyone see any comparisons or contrasts? Just, just the second and third line. Uh, verse number one. <coughs> or, uh, what's, oh, all, what's, printed, what's printed on that page there? Okay. So, be, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, is there any comparison to, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted? Oh, so two, two, two. oh I'm sorry. No, lines two and three, sorry. Oh, okay. Are the poor the broken hearted? Well, there's something similar, at least, um, between the poor and the broken hearted, right? Um, so, yeah, just for now, um, there's a similarity there between the recipients. Any other? That's good. That's excellent. Any other? Well, I'm sorry, what was it? What, is it the poor versus broken hearted? Well, we're just looking for comparisons of lines two and three. Okay. And that God has sent him to do both things. Good. Yes, sent um, by, um, by God, the Sovereign Lord. So he is in line two, and then the Sovereign Lord would be the the one um, that's doing the sending of verse line two. But uh, in line two, is it 
scent exactly, or is scent parallel to something else? Okay, well, yes, that's right. But is the word sent in line three parallel to something else in line two? Right. So in line two, he's been anointed to blah, blah, blah. And in line three, he's been sent to what follows. Do you see that? So you've got the verbs there, um, anointed and sent, are both done to um, this person, which we're calling the conqueror, and he's going to do something to the poor in one and the brokenhearted in the other. So we've got sent and anointed are parallel, and brokenhearted and poor are parallel. Is there anything else that's parallel? Yes, Lord and He who is, who is doing the appointing and the sending. Good. And there's at least one more. Yeah. Yes, but... That's right. But before we move on to that fourth line, you're right though. Proclaim is the one. Um, to proclaim the good news to the poor and so he's been anointed to proclaim by God and bind up. He's been, yeah. So this speaker, the me of those lines, I'm sorry I didn't explain this very clearly, but the Lord has appointed him, the speaker, to proclaim good news to the poor, and he has, the Lord has sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. Okay, so that, um, if John were here, he's not here today, but if he were, he would tell us that this is a, a Hebrew parallelism. He likes to talk about that. Um, so the two lines, it happens a lot in Psalms and Proverbs, if you notice, in poetry. And this is a poem. Um, in poetry, there's parallel lines. Uh, couple, it's a couplet. Uh, there's some interesting things about this particular couplet, though. Um, and um, the since I accidentally printed it on your page, you can't discover it for yourself. But the um, binding up, um, I'm sure you all remember from uh, a first lesson about chapter 1, that in chapter 1, verse 6, that, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> I know you are. Uh, <laughs> we all knew that. We talked yeah. about uh, uh, yeah, as soon as, yeah, as soon as you said bind up, I thought, that reminds me of something from uh, three months ago. In chapter 1. But if you look at verse 6, um, if you remember the beginning of the book is explaining the situation and how bad it is. Um, and verse 6 says, the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Um, so, um, now at the end of the book, um, the, the messianic figure, the conqueror, is sent to bandage, to bind up. So, literarily, it comes full circle in the book um, as a lit literary device, the end of the book and the beginning of the book. Uh, but functionally, what, what is actually, what is it actually, what's the point? Like, a nice literary structure which doesn't mean anything in the real world is pointless. So what's the actual point? That the problem that chapter 1 began explaining, which is human sin, and not just human sin, but the incurableness of human sin, that chapters 1 through 39 
explored in depth. Remember, um, just you finally, you finally get a good king, Hezekiah, who finally trusts the Lord and sees him miraculously save them from an army of almost 200,000 soldiers. And the very next story is him failing to trust the Lord. So, um, so the incurableness of human sin is the problem that this book is exploring and finally um, that problem will finally be solved. Yeah. And that's what this is all about. Um, okay. Um, let's look at question two. What is the structure of the second sentence? We're so used to thinking in terms of verses that when you talk about lines or sentences, sometimes it throws us off. I should have thought of that. Um, but... Um, the Thursday night class will get the benefit of your confusion. <laughs> um, I think I was talking about what's going to happen in the future. And you were supposed to do something. Um, proclaim and all that. Too. Yes, yes. It's going to be future and it's going to be all these actions will take place. Um, can anyone add to that? Because from, from he has sent all the way to the end of verse 3 is all one sentence. Well, there's a lot of verbs in there. Yeah, and while you're talking about that, let's just do question 3. Put a box around all the things the Anointed One will do that will help you. We've got proclaim. We've got bind up. Got proclaim again. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh huh. Good. Um, so there's seven things um, total. One because one of them is in the first sentence. Uh well. Um, look what it says. To proclaim freedom for the captains and release. I think release is something that's... Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, but as long as we're talking about those things, um, those would be the direct objects. Um, and not everyone has a direct object. Hi, Donna. That is fine. No more. No more. Twelve thirty. Back to two thirty. Cutting it too close. It's quite all right. It is. I'd rather. I thought I could make it when I signed up. It's okay. We'd rather have you here late than not at all. Um. So, okay, so um, those, let me see if I can, let me just, Donna, let me give you this, maybe a little cheat sheet for you. Oh, she got a cheat sheet. She got a cheat sheet, <laughs> yes. Just a kitchen hope. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, some of those things that we just put a box around have a direct object, right? Like for in sentence one, anointed me to proclaim what's being proclaimed, good news. Um, right? And then the recipient is to the poor. Um, now, grammatically, brokenhearted might be the direct object. But um, functionally, the brokenhearted is the recipient. So it would be more linked to the poor. Um, and then, then in Proclaim Freedom for the Captives, 
freedom would be what's being proclaimed again. So, um, I, what did I say there? Put a circle around the direct object. So, a circle freedom. And then, um, and then I'll let you go through and underline all the recipients of all these. I'll give you a minute to do it and circle all the direct objects. Is there another sheet besides this? I don't want to mess this one up for you. No, no, that's extra. That was for my wife, but she's not here. So, you can do this if you want. Okay. Okay, what do we do? We're supposed to add a line. The recipients of all these actions, who's benefiting from all these things he's doing. Okay, um, it's okay if you're not done, but let's talk about what you found. Um, I, I think doing that helps you see the structure. Also, of course, I laid it out, spaced it out in a way that hopefully was helpful. <coughs> um, what, what did you find for the rest of these actions that the that the Anointed One was sent to do. W do you find anything in common with all the recipients? <clears throat> Everything is coming from the Spirit of the Lord, or...? Uh, yeah, that's really good. What was that? She said, Everything is coming from the Spirit of the Lord. Um, that is really good, and that we're going to talk about that more. Shortly. When I look at all the recipients, I see a lot of sadness. Yeah. Among the, recipients. the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners, those who mourn, those who grieve. And even, even though these are not technically recipients, so you're not supposed to underline them, um, indirectly you can tell who the recipients of the last three lines are. Um, and he's going to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That means they must have had ashes on them. Um, and um, oil of joy instead of mourning, that means they must have been mourning. Garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So somebody had a spirit of despair. Um, so yeah, mu much despair, sadness, mourning, grieving. 
poverty, prison. And so the anointed one is sent to proclaim good news to them. What else is he going to proclaim to them? Good. Release. Yeah, release. Uh, yes, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Um, yes, and a garment of praise. Um, obviously, um, oil of joy is uh, a metaphor. Um, I don't think... It would be a stretch to say that it's the oil itself that brings the joy, although going back to chapter 1, verse 6 again, you didn't have any bandages and you didn't have any oil to soothe your wounds. We don't put oil to soothe wounds in America. I kind of wonder, like, what good that did. <laughs> that was um, medicinal. Maybe it does. I think it is medicinal. You know, the, the oils are medicinal. Some people still use oils for, for healing. Yeah. Sometimes they, they um, suggest vitamin E oil. Scars. Well, yeah. Anyway, my point is that there is a um, a symbolic <clears throat> description going on here. A garment of praise. Um, what is a garment of praise? Um, is it saying that the garments themselves praise God? Possibly. I mean, if we're... It's like a covering rather than a natural garment. It's possible. Um, I would say, I would be more inclined to say people are going to be wearing praise. They're going to praise so much, it's going to be like they're wearing it as a garment. Right. Um, That's what I meant, just kind of covering it. Yeah. Not an actual thing. Uh huh. Um, and if. A garment can be used as something that's going to protect you against something else. So if you praise someone, it's going to protect you against Satan. Yeah, especially if this is talking about the eternal state where we're with the Lord and we're praising Him. Um, all other problems will pale in comparison to how great He is. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to think of a good example that's more concrete. Um, it's like um, it would be like if you let's say there's a millionaire in America and they go to a war-torn country and they take an orphan who has nothing literally nothing no home, nothing and they bring him, bring him to America in this mansion, and the first thing they do is give him an ice cream cone, and he immediately drops it. And he's all distraught over that. You could say to him, you know what, you can have as many ice cream cones as you want for the rest of your life, because you're going to inherit millions of dollars. So just don't worry about that. Um, so the greatness of what they received and who they're with now makes any other problem negligible. Does that make sense? That's how it will be in the eternal state with praise, with our praise of God. Now there may not be other problems. I don't know. There may still be mosquitoes. Or, you know, I don't. I don't know. But. Jumping out of me, 
at the time of his death, he was wearing a crown of thorns and, and a crown of beauty instead of ashes, which you think of as death. Uh-huh. And the oil of joy, he was anointed with oil, which was, you know, the morning, but now it's going to be an oil of joy and then the garment of praise. They put the they were all about him mocking him as king of the Jews. Which yeah. At the time of his crucifixion may have been made of him in despair, but now it's become a garment of praise. Yeah. I don't know how much this stretch is. Well, I don't either. <laughs> um, typically, I try to be very careful of making comparisons like that. But that one does fit very nicely. Um, so I don't know mm -hmm. uh, if Isaiah or the Spirit of God, which was inspiring Isaiah to write this, had that in mind. Mm -hmm. If he didn't, I certainly don't want to put it in God's mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the very least, I can say that's very interesting. Uh, and maybe he did. Um, Um, and also, we're going to get to Jesus at the end of this. Um, some of you might remember that Jesus quoted this passage to begin his ministry. We'll, talk, we'll, we'll, we'll open up that passage in the Gospels later. Um, okay. Um, we don't see much difference between captives and prisoners in America. But there is quite a difference. What, what, what's the difference between a captive and a prisoner? Well, a captive would be somebody that you would um, capture in like war. Yeah. A prisoner may be just somebody that um, maybe it was against Jew, the Jews or against the religion or something like that, and they threw them in prison. I don't know why they would, you know. A prisoner is different than from a captain. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, we will say like wartime and peacetime okay. would be the difference. If you could do a trial and everything, where the other would just take. Yes, yeah. Um. Okay, uh, and then um, uh, the anointed one, which by the way, anointed is the word for Messiah or Christ. Right? So in English the word is anointed, in Hebrew it's Messiah, and in Greek it's Christ. So the anointed one here, um, is the anointed one freeing the prisoners and releasing, or freeing the captives and releasing the prisoners? He just, he just, he's just proclaiming it. Yeah. He's proclaiming it, yeah. Um, it's a little bit different than doing it. Um, so we'll have to explore what that means that he's proclaiming it. Um, Is it forecasting? You know, like foretelling, prophesying? What do you mean? That's um, a question. I'm not saying it is. I'm yeah. Um, like well. The gospel? Oh. Uh, go ahead. I think sometimes it's a God statement of what you might want to have occur, but still the human choice involves so there's no surety that that actually is going to happen, even though mm -hmm. God may want it. Um, yeah, it's tricky because there's a spiritual element here, and there's also a tangible element, so I think um, the proclaiming of it makes it happen. Um, a good example is if a conqueror comes in, like um, when the Allies liberated um, Auschwitz and um, some of those other concentration camps. I don't know if they actually got on the loudspeakers or if what, but if they were just like, okay, letting you all know, you're free now. 
we're, yeah, we're proclaiming, at least here, maybe in Berlin they're still fighting, but here the war's over, I'm proclaiming freedom for the captives. Um, I read uh, um, in um, a biography about Bonhoeffer, um, one of the other prisoners when the war was over um, ripped off his, um, the Nazis made them wear, I mean, he saw the Allies come in through a window, um, he ripped off this thing that the Nazis made him wear and threw it on the floor and danced a little jig on top of it. He was so happy that it, that was all over. Um, so in, in that case then, the conquerors, the proclamation of it makes it so, because the conqueror is now in charge. And whoever was in charge before is not in charge. Um, and that happens to us in a spiritual sense now. When Jesus Christ proclaims the gospel, that gospel can make that happen to you spiritually. But, ultimately, there will be a day of tangible release from all problems and snares and suffering. So that's why it's a little bit tricky. Um, okay, verse 2, <clears throat> another in this chain here. He's going to proclaim good news. He's going to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom, release. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. <clears throat> what do you think it means that, that the Anointed One will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? He's going to say... Uh, yeah, it has ties to the Jubilee year when um, uh, all debts were canceled and slaves were released. Um, there's, other, there's another year that happens more often than Jubilee year where certain things are um, freed and I can't really remember should have looked this up before. But um, like every seven years, something goes... And then there was like the, ju was the Jubilee, the jubilee like year. year. Was that yeah, years? so there would be a, um, a cycle, mm -hmm. a 50-year cycle, and so the 49th year would be a Sabbath year, mm -hmm. and then the 50th year would be the Jubilee year. So that would be two years in a row where they didn't plant. They didn't plow and plant. Mm -hmm. They just grew whatever grew from last year's crops. For two years, they had to just trust that something would grow on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a wheat field. I hope some wheat grows <laughs> up. <laughs> um, I had a garden in Indiana. Everybody had big gardens there out in the country. And I put straw around all my plants. Mm -hmm. It would keep weeds down and it would also protect the soil so that the rain wouldn't pack the soil down, the rain would... Okay. Anyway, um, and I was pulling up weeds around my tomatoes, and some of the weeds I was like, this is a very strange weed. That was wheat from the straw. From the straw. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so that story doesn't really help us understand the passage very well. But my point is... Um, that just like kind of randomly grew on its own accidentally. That's what they were supposed to rely on for those two years. Um, so it's actually nice. It's like a two two years off. Probably only happens once in your life, but two years in a row off, it's a nice sabbatical leave from your job. Um, if you're a man, women still have to raise their kids, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, but if, to get that little two year vacation. You have to trust that mm. you'll have food to eat. Mm. Um, so, that, but that's great. Uh, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor is a great, and a year is, um, 
references that. But if the anointed one is proclaiming that, he's not like, hey, like, you know, Jesus on the scene, guess what? Most of you lost track, but this is actually the year of Jubilee. We haven't been keeping track of it for the past 900 years, but here it is. That's not what he's proclaiming. He's, pro he's using that symbolically to proclaim something else. What do you think that is? Release from sin? Uh, yes. I think it's when the Jews realized that they, they, they were sinning and they lost the Lord and they wanted to get the Lord back, that they started believing in Him again. Um, when and when did that happen? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Oh, okay, when did it happen? Oh, in this story here? Oh, well, at all. Oh, at all? What are you referring to? I, I agree with you. Well, I'm just, just asking you to explain it more. Okay. Um, in here, it, 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 t it tells of the times when they go into to cap captivity. Uh -huh. And then I thought later on that they started believing in, in the Lord again. Um, and they got came back from their captivity? Mm -hmm. um, yes. The only problem is not that many of them actually turn to the Lord. Okay. Uh, at least in a lasting way. Okay. Um, but regardless of how many of them had genuine conversions while they were in captivity, the year of freedom did come. Right? Yes. They came back. Yes. Um, so what you have is a prophecy by Isaiah, this is Isaiah, um, and here's a prophecy that we're reading about, and this, Isaiah lived, you know, around, um, just in very round numbers, um, we'll say 700 BC, 700 years before Jesus. And then, again, in very round numbers, uh, 200 years later, the Jews came back from exile. So the words that he spoke became actual fact. Um, um, I don't know. Maybe um, this is supposed to be broken shackle. Right? Like handcuffs or something. And they're actual, actually got released. Archaeologists have actually found some of these writings in cuneiform that said people can go back to their homes. And that was the Jews and it was also other people. Um, and the guy who wrote that, Isaiah, actually prophesied 200 years before. We didn't have time to cover Cyrus. But um, he says, I'm going to raise up a guy named Cyrus in 200 years and he will let you go back. So that actually came true there. Um, but then roughly the year zero, this is going to come true in another way. And Jesus is going to use this text, this exact passage. He's going to read it in a synagogue and say, this is coming true today. So there is a sense in which it happens there. That's what you're talking about, right? Yes. There's also a spiritual sense in which it happens, this release, there. Jesus proclaims the gospel, and people can get saved and be released. But there will also be, at some unknown time in the future, an ultimate, because we've got a tangible fulfillment and a spiritual fulfillment. This is wind and spirit. It's not a tangible thing. There will also be, be, those two things will come together and there will be a spiritual and tangible fulfillment of all this stuff someday in the future when Jesus returns in, in the eternal state. Does that make sense? I don't know when that will be, but Jesus said he didn't even know when it would be when he was on earth. Because he laid aside, at that time he laid aside all his divine knowledge. Okay, 
So, uh, the year of Jubilee or the year of the Lord's favor does refer to what was going to be in store for the Jewish people then. And it also does refer to a spiritual. Somebody over here said something about spiritual. Um, and it also refers to, in the end, when all wrongs are made right. So this year is a time period, and the day, a much more swift... I mean, you can use year and day to refer to. Back in my day, right, a general thing, and the year of this, uh, it doesn't have to be a year and a day, but um, a day is a much more swift and decisive thing in the year of the... The day of the vengeance of our God. And we've talked that we had a whole lesson on the day of the Lord <coughs> coming. Um, and we don't see the vengeance side as good. But once again, you go back to the Auschwitz liberation. And <coughs> that was a great release and good news and the year of favor for those prisoners. But for the guards, it was a day of vengeance, and it meant uh, war crime trials for some of them who were in charge of things. Um, of course, some of them fled, but um, <clears throat> but many of them were captured and convicted of things. So uh, vengeance is good. It's just not very popular in America. It is in real life, but when you talk about it, it sounds mean. The comfort those who mourn, um, provide for those who grieve in Zion. Now here's a, <clears throat> a reference to Zion. Um, that doesn't fully make sense outside of this. The, remember I said this is a big chiasm? Does anyone remember that? I know it's been already been like 40 minutes, but... Um, <laughs> but we're looking right here, um, and this, these, outer circ these outer two describe the people of God um, <clears throat> embracing all nations. Just real briefly, for example, in the beginning of this in 56, um, and we'll talk about this more next week, but um, 56.3, the very beginning of this whole section, You don't have to turn there, but you can. 56 verse 3. Let no foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Don't say that. You're not a Jew, but you've joined yourself to the Lord. You're not going to be excluded from his people. Um, that's just one example of that major theme there um, at the beginning and end of this section of how all nations, and this has been going on all throughout Isaiah, right? About Zion, all nations will stream to it. Okay. Um, wow. We are, I thought, surely we'll not run out of time in this because, but then because I thought that, I allowed myself to ramble on about unimportant things. Okay, um, question four, how was he prepared or appointed for these, all these tasks? The Spirit of the Lord comes on him, and he is anointed. He is anointed, remember David being anointed as king? Um, and then he's sent. But that, yeah, the main one is the Spirit. <clears throat> okay, and then um, just as a quick aside, um, notice those last three lines. 
Uh, what do they all have in common? Crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They're all reversals, transformations from this to this. And that's a huge theme throughout all Isaiah. Okay. Um, so um, the Spirit on the Lord's anointed one, the Spirit comes upon him. Now, uh, that, before we move to the next page, think of that idea of coming on him. Christians have the Spirit indwelling them, but in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon people. Mm -hmm. It would come upon Samson, came upon Saul, and they would defeat. And it didn't stay. It just came upon them and left. Um, The way we have it. Thrown away. Yeah. Yeah. We have the Spirit of the Lord indwelling us. Yes. Typically, yes. It would come upon them for a, a specific task, and they'd do it. And they'd be done. Um, but with David and Saul, it seemed to be a more long-term thing. Mm-hmm. Saul had it, and then it departed from him. Right. And an evil spirit came. Um, and then David sends and says, don't, in Psalm 51, when he's repenting, don't take your spirit. And you can almost hear him thinking, shoot, this is exactly what happened to Saul. He had the spirit of the Lord, and mm-hmm. then at one point he sinned. Um, and actually, Saul's sin wasn't even as bad as David's sin, but that's separate. But anyway, God took his spirit away, and he's like, don't take, take your spirit from me. Uh, it's something like, renew a right, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit, and don't take your spirit from me. Anyway, I'm getting the lyrics of the song. Yes. Okay. So, um, let's look at this concept, the three, different, um, the three different portraits of the Messiah, the Anointed One, and how they have the Spirit. Um, so, the next page, these are links between parts 1, 2, and 3. You, so, you don't need to find them in your Bible. Just very briefly, could someone read um, from chapter 11? It's the uh, second page. Here it is. Oh, you got it. Um, Can someone read from chapter 11 there, that, those four verses? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Okay, so this is the, the king one. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And where does he come from, the anointed? The, the line of Jesse. Yeah, the line of Jesse, um, which is royal. Uh, David was Jesse's son. And eventually Christ. Uh-huh. And uh, what does he do? Uh, so that's uh, where he comes from, and this is what he does. What does he do? He's a judge. He's a judge, yes. <laughs> exactly, judge. And how is that royal? In our country, the judges are totally separate from executive mm-hmm. powers. But well, they judged everybody in in the, the providence or their country or whatever you want to say. Right. People uh, would come with problems to them or to the king. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Back then, a king was all branches of government. He made the laws, <clears throat> and he uh, judged cases. And how does the spirit produce that? What he, what he does, that royal action that he's doing, how does the spirit? And it comes from God. Yes. And how does that enable him to judge? It enables him to judge righteously. Um, how does the spirit enable the righteous judgment? 
Yes, there's, there's four lines there. Mm -hmm. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So without all that stuff in verse 2, how's he going to judge righteously? So the Spirit enables that. Okay, very quickly. Um, 42, when we talked about the servant thing last week. Here is my servant. So that was the king. Here's my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Um, what does he not do? He doesn't break a bruise. Well, okay, he doesn't shout or cry out. He doesn't raise his voice in the streets. Sorry that I'm not ending on time. I understand. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't shout or cry out. He doesn't break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. What's all that about? His ministry... It's not forcing people. Yes. It is very meek and mild and unobtrusive ministry. And that is the servant's ministry. Mm -hmm. It's not presented here as the conqueror. Um, and you can see that in Jesus' life, right? He led like a lamb to the slaughter. Did he say, wait, wait, this isn't fair? Mm -hmm. And sometimes he was on trial and he just didn't say anything. And he'd done the cross. Yeah. He didn't. He just prays for the, his murderers yeah. while they're killing him. Um, okay, so that's what he doesn't do. And here's what he, what, what he does. Um, he will bring justice to the nations. At the end of verse 1. How does the servant bring justice to the nations? You know, I realize that that is a the end, in the end of verse 3, in faithfulness he will bring forth justice. <clears throat> so the islands often refers to the nations. It's just those people. The Jews were you know, on the mainland. There's those peoples way out there. You know, like the island of North America and the things they didn't really know about. But um, in his teachings, the islands will put their hope. He's bringing justice to the nations. I don't know for sure, but I think the servant brings justice not in the way the conqueror brings justice. The servant doesn't bring justice because he punishes the wicked. The servant brings justice because he makes people just. And through his example? <clears throat> not through his example. Why not if he's doing if he's doing the right thing and he's right? Because while he's doing the right thing, they hate him. And they beat him and they murder him. But if he's staying faithful, that would be they wouldn't they have and the fact that he was successful, then wouldn't that bring hope? Well I mean, it should it should, but it doesn't. But it doesn't. A great mm -hmm. example a great example like Gandhi does not change people's lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the act of dying in my place that he performed on the cross did change my life. It didn't just like, wow, that's a great example. It actually changed something. I Not just changed my heart. It took out my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. And so then, after that happens, after that transformation happens, then yes, I follow his example. But, I mean, you try to follow the example of Jesus, and you're not actually born again, not actually regenerate, it's just going to lead to frustration. Hopefully, it'll lead to so much frustration that you realize, I can't do this. He's got to change me. And then it would lead to repentance and salvation. Um, okay, so how does the Spirit produce that? Well, he does that through vicari his vicarious sacrifice, dying in our place. 
Uh, the Spirit produces that because the Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism and guided him in all he did, including going to the cross. And then after the cross, how did Jesus give the Spirit to his disciples? <clears throat> like this. <sighs> No, he breathed on them and said, oh, Receive the Holy Spirit. The end of the Gospel of John. It's, very, it's strange. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. Because he was indwelt with the Spirit and he gave the Spirit to them. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's exciting. It is. I just, I, I just always think of the yeah, Pentecost. Yeah, yes. Um, I, I know what you mean. I don't know um, theologically why. Did they get the Spirit and dwell in them there in that upper room? Did get the power? I don't know. But um, Jesus had the Spirit. That's what enabled him to um, and then we get to our passage, and we're out of time, but um, let me just say this. Uh, <clears throat> the what's there on this page is less than what we had on the previous page. Right? And when Jesus started his ministry, he's baptized, the Spirit descends on him, and it says the Spirit led him out into the desert to be tempted, and then he came back into Galilee, by this power of the Spirit, and he's preaching now, and he's drawing huge crowds with the power of the Spirit. And this is how he starts his ministry. Because he's going around preaching everywhere. The first sermon he preaches, he goes into a synagogue to open his ministry. And what they have these scrolls. And they handed him the Isaiah scroll. And he unrolls it to this passage, Isaiah 61. And he reads... The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He stops. And he says, that passage has been fulfilled right now. In your hearing. From Isaiah. From Isaiah. He doesn't finish the line, though. Because the day of the vengeance of our God, Jesus isn't fulfilling that at that time. But he is fulfilling all the other things. Jesus knows that someday he will come back and fulfill that line. But in his first coming, his earthly ministry, he wasn't fulfilling that. But he was fulfilling the other things. This is all come alive. Yeah, so you see how it happened here, then it happened during his life, the, the spiritual aspects of it, and then the vengeance aspect will happen there. And, um, yeah, and, and how does the Spirit do that? Well, the Spirit enabled him to know that he was the Messiah because he didn't know that when he was one day old. But, um, at his baptism, the Spirit revealed all that stuff to him. Okay. So, so what are the lines on the Conqueror? So <coughs> the Conqueror, yeah. Um, uh, what time period does he proclaim for his servants? The year of favor. The year of the Lord's favor. What time period does he proclaim for their enemies? Um, the day of vengeance. Now, in this whole section, this chiasm, it's contrasting the servants uh, and their enemies. And there's all this stuff um, going on because it's 11 chapters and we only looked at three verses. But... Um, mm -hmm. But he proclaims that, uh, and they're connected with conquering. It's, it's the Auschwitz thing. The conqueror comes in and proclaims freedom. And then, and then later, at the trial, 
uh, the war crime trial vengeance. And the Spirit guided Jesus into all this. All right, we got one class left. So. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah. What happens after this class? What's going to be next? Thing? Well, we'll have December off. Yes. Um, and in that month, we'll announce. Uh, we, we need to stop. We need to move away from the one month classes because that's what everybody wants. So um, we need to figure out exactly what's going to happen. Um, but that will all be announced multiple times in December. <laughs>